All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this evening's webinar in honor of Women's History Month, Clean Energy for All, a fireside chat with Steph Spears, CEO of Solstice. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ellen Sue, Yale College Class of 2013. I am a member of the leadership team of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. Our discussion tonight is co-sponsored by Yale Blue Green and Yale Women. Accelerate Yale is a global community of alumni and friends of Yale who are engaged in innovation, tech, and entrepreneurship. Please note that we are being recorded this evening with all participants muted. Tonight's session will last an hour and we will reserve the final 25 minutes for your questions. If you do have a question that you would like to submit, please do so via the Q&A button on the bottom bar of your screen. We will also be monitoring the chat. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this evening. So big welcome to Lauren Graham, a 2013 graduate of the Yale School for, of the Environment, the chair of Yale Blue Green and secretary of Yale Women. Lauren is a social impact consultant to nonprofits and mission-driven startups through her company, Velvet Frame, and she also lectures at Penn and uh, Berg. She has an eclectic background rooted in environment and sustainability, social entrepreneurship, and expertise using creative media, including film, games, music, and virtual reality for public engagement. She holds a master's in nonprofit leadership from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's in sociology from Stanford and a BA in international relations from Stanford. Uh, with, uh, without any more hesitation, I will introduce Lauren. Thank you so much, Ellen. I'd now like to introduce our guest for the evening, Steph Spears, Yale College Class of 2007. Steph is an entrepreneur and community builder with management experience in the Middle East, South Asia, and the United States. She co-founded and runs Solstice, an enterprise dedicated to radically expanding the number of American households that can take advantage of clean energy using community shared solar farms. Solstice also invented the Energy Score, a new proprietary underwriting standard for solar customers that is simultaneously more accurate in predicting who will pay their utility bill and more inclusive of low income Americans, more so than FICO score credit scores, the industry standard. She was selected as an Echoing Green Climate Fellow Inc. Magazine's Female Founder 100, Elle's U.S. Women Entrepreneur of the Year, a Kia Revisionary for Techstars Boston, a Renewable Energy World 40 Under, a Renewable Energy World 40 Under 40 in Solar, a Grist 50 Fixer, a GLG Social Impact Fellow, a Cordis Fellow, and an Acumen Global Fellow. She previously led sales and marketing innovation initiatives in India at D-Light, a solar products company powering areas without reliable electricity, spearheaded Acumen's renewable energy impact investing strategy in Pakistan, developed Middle East policy as the youngest policy director at the White House National Security Council, and managed field operations in seven states for the first Obama presidential campaign. She holds a BA from Yale, a master's in public affairs with distinction from Princeton, and an MBA from MIT with a certificate in entrepreneurship and innovation. And she originally hails from Hawaii. Steph, it is an honor to have you with us uh, and thank you to Accelerate Yale for hosting this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lauren, for that generous introduction and to Yale for having me. So let's jump right in. Um, you have an amazing background and it would be wonderful if you could just share with us the story of what inspired you to build Solstice. Yeah, for sure. I had a very different career trajectory. I was working in policy and politics for a while and it was actually working on the Arab Spring in the Middle East um, that led me to work on renewables. And we would be driving through the streets of Yemen in our armored vehicles and we'd be talking about how to get a dictator out of power but when you looked out the window there would be people lined up waiting for fuel they couldn't get the fuel to power their everyday lives because terrorists were blowing up oil pipelines and so it felt like our addiction to oil was just a disaster and, and catastrophic, and it was affecting people's everyday lives. And so that's what prompted me to leave what I thought was my dream job at the time and go be uh, you know, a 30-year-old intern at a renewable energy uh, investment company. And then I worked for one of their portfolio companies doing solar microgrids, solar lanterns, and solar home systems in India and Pakistan. And then I had another realization where I, I looked around and, and my co-founder and I said, 
you know, we're in the middle of nowhere um, in a village and they have solar, but back home in America, we don't know that many people that actually have solar. And it seems like the only people that have solar are more affluent folks. So we looked into the problem and then I decided to move back to the US to start Solstice. And I'd say the second reason why, what drew me to this work of energy equity and trying to make the energy system more just and equitable is largely because I was raised by an incredible immigrant single mom who worked on minimum wage. And she raised three kids on minimum wage, which unfortunately hasn't changed um, in a long time. And so watching her my whole life decide, should we pay the rent this month or should we pay for food this month? or do we pay the phone bill? And making that decision felt so unnecessary. And we live in an age in which energy savings are possible for you if you can get access to clean energy. And so that's what made us wanna build Solstice. We wanna put affordable solar power, clean energy savings in the hands of ordinary Americans. That theme of democratizing access to clean energy is so important. And that's one of the things that really stands out about your company. So to go uh, again in the direction of talking about what diversity, equity, and inclusion practices look like within uh, your company, how does it show up in the day-to-day? -day? Yeah, there's kind of two ways to look at um, diversity, equity, inclusion within any organization. And one is to look at equity in, meaning what are you doing internally to become a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization? And then what are you doing externally, equity out? Um, and so equity out, we are dedicated to making sure that we increase access to community solar to people who have traditionally been locked out. And by that, I mean low income and communities of color. Um, low income and communities of color, study after study, show that these populations are most affected by climate change. They live in hotter neighborhoods quantifiably because they don't live near green spaces. They live closer to fossil fuels, which means that they're suffering disproportionately from asthma and air pollution, which is, by the way, obviously a, a, a factor in who is dying and who's living from COVID. And these populations are paying a disproportionate amount of their income on energy. So they have a higher energy burden, largely because they live in inefficient housing. And so you take all of those factors and you see that the people who are most affected by climate change are also the people who are least likely to get clean energy. And the way we have to change that is we have to work to put clean energy within their reach, make it accessible for them. Um, because it's not as if they don't want it. Uh, communities of color, which are, you know, the frontline climate communities are disproportionately black and brown and low income communities, they want renewable energy. They are supportive of the environment. It's just that renewables have been a premium um, for so many decades. And now we have the opportunity to offer it to them at a savings. And so changing who gets to buy solar is transformative because it doesn't have to only go to a tiny portion of the country. It can go to more people and we can build a clean energy constituency. And the other flip side of diversity, equity, inclusion is the equity in peace. And we take the stance that solstice exists to give people who are in from non-dominant groups opportunities. And that includes opportunities to work in clean energy. You know, clean energy is, is unfortunately extremely monolithic and, and not diverse. Women only make up 25% of the renewable energy industry. And then you look at people in the C-suite and in boards of energy companies, and that number's far lower. And then you look at the number of people of color in the energy industry, and it's even, even tinier, minuscule. And so every policy we have at Solstice is geared towards making the organization more diverse, equitable inclusion. Most people think of just hiring and let's, let's hire a diverse team. And then that takes care of diversity, equity, inclusion. And that's not it. You know, it's, you have to talk about what do you pay people at Solstice? We have a pay equity policy where everyone earns um, the same as someone else working in a similar job. And you don't have disparities between women and men or people of color and, and non-people of color. And 
um, and white folks, they, they earn the same and we make sure because we have a pay equity policy. We also have parental leave um, and we give people five weeks off a year for vacation and give them a flexible work schedule. And those are also ways to make organizations more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And Solstice is hiring right now as well. Yes, we are hiring. Yes, come please join our team. One thing that I do love about our team is that it, it is a group of people who are extremely intrinsically motivated to do good in the world at a very high performance, high quality level. But the other thing is they're also incredibly collaborative, kind and compassionate people. And having a company full of extremely competent and extremely compassionate people is pretty unique, we found. And, and so come please join our team. Thanks, Steph. Uh, just a, another follow-up related to DEI. It's so important to hear you talk about this from a leadership standpoint, which sets a very positive tone for everyone who's part of the organization. I'm curious, are there other organizations within the environment and sustainability space that you would highlight as having the kinds of practices that you think need to be replicated and maybe some that are lagging behind a little bit? Yeah, so I think some of the other organizations that are doing good work in this space are the environmental justice organizations, and there are a ton of them. You know, um, NAACP has an incredible climate justice program. The Solutions Project is a great uh, funder and supporter of grassroots climate justice movements. Elemental Accelerator, which is one of our funders, which is an, a branch of Emerson Collective. Uh, is, is a great organization that's trying to push equity and inclusion in the climate uh, space. Um, in terms of, you know, which ones could be better, I think the, the demographic numbers I pointed out indicate that literally everyone that are traditional players in our energy industry could be better. Uh, you know, that includes developers, financiers, and, and, and utilities. You know, they don't often have women and people of color on their boards or in leadership positions. And I think you often hear, oh, you know, it's a pipeline problem. We just don't have enough people in our pipeline. And I want to push a little bit back on that and say, I don't think it's a pipeline problem. I think it's a network problem. And so we have to work harder to expand our network because talented, brilliant people of color are out there who are excited to solve this climate issue. We just need to include them in our networks. Um, so it's not a pipeline problem, it's a network problem. Picking up on that whole idea of networks and the importance of networks, of course, this is a, a Yale sponsored event and thinking about the way that we can use and leverage our alumni network is, is critical. Uh, you had mentioned before uh, the effect of, of COVID and how COVID is changing the way that people are thinking about institutions and systems of all types. So uh, with everything that we're hearing about people rethinking their relationship between living and working, moving around, and also really uh, having to evaluate their income relative to what they spend on things like energy. I'm curious what you're seeing within Solstice around the effect of the pandemic on interest in uh, energy independence or in solar uh, more, more specifically. Yeah, so there's two very real tangible outcomes that have um, stemmed from the pandemic. One is that the average electricity bill has increased for people across the country. Um, generally, depending on whether you believe uh, the union of concerned scientists or not, it, it was, it's about 25% increase that they talk about. And so that's huge for people, particularly at a time when there's so many people out of work and struggling with the economy. And that leads to the second outcome, which is that currently, based on the trade organization that works on energy assistance programs, they say that 20% of the country is not paying their utility bills on time. So not only have utility bills increased, but a lot of people can't afford them and they're not able to pay them, particularly right now at a time where these state-by-state -state moratoriums on utility shutoffs are expiring, meaning that we're approaching this, this deadline where a lot of states can shut off people's electricity because they're not able to pay their bill through often no fault of their own because we are in a pandemic. And so that has changed our business dramatically and the way that we interact with customers. Obviously we can't talk to people in person anymore, but 
uh, more than that, I think more than ever, people are attracted to something like community solar. So the products we offer community solar means that people can benefit from a virtual solar farm somewhere in their community. It's not on their rooftop and they're buying a portion of a centralized shared solar farms power. And the cool thing about that is that it's not a premium. It's a guaranteed discount for many, many states across the country. And so people don't have to put anything on their home. They're not paying anything up front. They're getting guaranteed savings and they're getting to support local clean energy. And so that proposition of saving 10% off your electricity bill every year becomes much, much more enticing in an economy like this. And at the same time, I don't know if this is the pandemic or the new political environment we find ourselves in, but suddenly climate is trendy. I never thought I'd see uh, this after how many years of working on it. And um, you know, we would go to these energy conferences just a couple of years ago and climate justice and energy equity, maybe, maybe you'd have a panel on it at the conference, but it would never be on the main stage. It would always be in some side closet. And the only people that would show up to that room are, were the nonprofit folks. And now we're at a moment where there's a reckoning with the gross inequalities that our systems have led to that are really leading to you know, people living and dying and, and disproportionately. And so now I think people are having a reckoning with themselves and with society and saying, this is wrong. We need to change the systems. This cannot go on. And it's also the more we let it go on, gross inequality, the more we, we enact self-sabotage in our systems. And so that reckoning has led to a lot of people saying, what can I do? I recognize this is a problem and what can I do? And we hear that and we get so excited because we say, yes, this problem is hard. Making this energy system that has ex pretty much existed this way for more than a century and has deep, deep entrenched interests that are really difficult to undo. We need everyone as, as, as part of the solution to this climate change and climate justice is an all hands on deck problem. And so I think more people wanna get involved than ever. In the last three months, we've seen more corporations, more households um, get excited about solar than we've ever seen from our years of working on this. That's good to hear. And, and what you're really describing is, I think what a lot of us see this once in a generation opportunity to really usher in systems change. And uh, you had uh, an experience working previously along a political track before you became an environmental entrepreneur. So I'm, I'm curious uh, in your current capacity, what you think is the potential of the Biden administration's new infrastructure bill? And could that be a critical step towards reevaluating our energy infrastructure and advancing the solar economy? Yeah, and you know, the Biden has promised to decarbonize the US electricity system by 2035. That is not that far away and and it's a big job to do that. And and so it's a very exciting time for anyone who is excited to to tackle the problem of climate change. Um there is a quote by Warren Buffett that says, "It's only when the tide goes out do you realize who's swimming naked." And in a lot of ways, this pandemic was the tide going out and it exposed all the foundations of our systems as, as broken and having fissures and cracks throughout the whole system, our democratic system, our healthcare system, and they're all interconnected and, and policy has the ability to reshape incentives, reshape um, the structures and rebuild a better world. And so in some specific ways, um, I think the infrastructure bill is one of the most exciting things that we're gonna be seeing on climate because infrastructure is bipartisan and, and climate change mitigation should be bipartisan. We're, we haven't experienced it that way, but I think we're getting closer and closer to that because of how devastating natural disasters have been to farmers to everyone across the country is experiencing more extreme weather. And because it's affecting everyone, it's becoming more of a bipartisan issue. And the infrastructure bill is going to be really important to solve some of the most unsexy parts of our climate change problem, like the grid. Everyone should read the book, The Grid by Gretchen 
Back, I think is how you pronounce her last name. And it's a really good book about this, this grid that we've developed and lived in and what needs to change. The grid is one of the biggest obstacles to putting more clean energy in our country. It is just how antiquated the technology is, how it's unable to take on decentralized distributed generation, how it was built to cater to centralized fossil fuels uh, generation. And that legacy is preventing us from moving into the future. So if we can all agree, and we saw what happened in Texas, if we can all agree the way we've done business, it cannot dictate the way we will move into the future, then we have to improve and modernize our grid. And the only person that's, the only, the only entity that's gonna do that is our public sector. No, no private sector entity is gonna be like, let's modernize the grid and pay for that very expensive project. Um, and the other things that the infrastructure bill can do is create more efficient, affordable housing in this country. Uh, you know, I said the reason why low income populations and populations of color pay so much for energy is because they live in inefficient housing. And when there's a lot more we can do with that, with building new buildings, but also energy efficiency. And one of the most exciting things about uh, new infrastructure plans is building a lot more wind and solar and making sure that those projects are actually benefiting low-income communities and the people who are most affected by climate change. And you can do that by creating incentives for where projects get cited. You can do that by creating um, incentives or de-risking community engagement as a part of clean energy development, which is really not a part of clean energy development at the moment. Nobody really needs to tell the community or get the community's buy-in when they're building a project. And so these are really important things that I think need to be in a future infrastructure bill. Thank you for that. And one of the things that um, automatically comes to mind when I think about infrastructure and government spending is the access to large amounts of capital uh, via taxpayer dollars. But when you're running a company like Solsys and you're starting up, uh, that capital doesn't automatically uh, show up on its own. So in thinking about your experience as an entrepreneur and having to raise uh, funding in order to start your business, we often hear about how difficult it is for women, for people of color, not to mention women of color when it comes to securing uh, financing. So I'm just curious, uh, as someone who'd recently closed a successful round, what your secret sauce is, what your journey was, challenges, opportunities, how have you made uh, financial sustainability a part of Solstice as well as the energy sustainability a, a part of Solstice? Yeah, and, and you know, I've learned a lot about fundraising over the years, and I think in the beginning, I think as founders, we overemphasize financial capital, we think that is the most important because we don't have it. And you obviously need it to do the work, to hire amazing talent, to go out and build projects. But what I came to realize is, and there's an aphorism, if you ask for money, you'll get advice. And if you ask for advice, you'll get money. And another way of looking at that is um, don't focus on financial capital initially focus entirely on social capital. Talk to as many people who will talk with you about your crazy idea and who will listen to you drone on about your crazy idea and find a community and build up that community. And I promise you, financial capital will flow from that social capital. And so that's one lesson. The second thing is, I do not want to paint a picture that it's all been easy and it, 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 it hasn't. The statistics support that. You know, I thought, man, I can work really hard. Most people raise their around within six to 12 months. So if I work really hard, I can do it in three months. And that was not the case. The first round I did, it took me 10 months. And the second round took me six months. And I believe because we've done well in the last year, the next round will be easier. But it it is you know, you have to engage in this in this game and fundraising is dating. It is truly the closest corollary to fundraising is dating um, and all of the BS that sometimes comes along with that. And there are people for sure who have said really insensitive, misogynistic, um, often inappropriate things to me and my co-founder, who's another woman of color. But 
there are all these amazing other people who became our funders who were so excited to support us because we were women of color. And so what I learned is that sometimes it feels like there's not enough capital out there and you have to take what you can get. And I, I came to realize that there is actually a lot of capital out there and you have to just find your, your people, find your partners, because your funders are going to be your partners for life. Um, and there have been moments in our, in our history where we almost went out of business because, you know, my, the most important job I have is to bring in capital and I didn't bring in capital enough, you know, quickly enough, or, um, things were really tight. And the thing that always got out of uh, us out of those situations was that, that community, the social network, the social capital. And so I, I sit here, um, because we had a lot of help. And because nobody does anything on their own and there is no secret sauce. The last thing I'll say is people think fundraising is all about how well you pitch. It is about 50% your pitch, your storytelling, your business traction, and the other 50% is all process. You have to have a, run a process and it has to be really regimented and planned out well. You have to basically get all your funders to align at the same time such that they're all making offers to you and you're, you're going around and dating them all um, and seeing which is the right partner for you. And it's all about follow-up. Uh, HubSpot says that 80% of sales happen between the fifth and the 12th meeting. And that is absolutely true. It's all in the follow-up. And so running a, a sales pipeline process is something that I think a lot of founders forget to do. And then also just making sure that if you get capital, that you help other people get capital too, because only above, just above 2% of venture capital goes to women founders. And the numbers are much more dire for black and brown women. What you're saying about finding your people, activating your network, that really resonates with me. And I hope that the Yale community at large has been a part of that positive wave that has kept you going uh, as, an, as an individual, but more broadly uh, as a business owner. So switching gears a, a little bit into the, the Yale experience, uh, I really relate with your story in the sense that where I started when I finished undergrad and where I am now are two totally different places and uh, switching in and out of different fields and pivoting has also been part of my journey. So I'm curious, uh, is there a, another version of, of you in a parallel universe that went down a different professional track that you think about uh, or something that you could see yourself doing if you were not an energy entrepreneur? Before I started Solstice, I did have a moonlighting career as a 90s hip hop DJ and under the name DJ B.I.G. Spoon in homage to Notorious B.I.G. But um, in terms of an alternate career, I think in my most uh, self-indulgent moments, I actually want to be an artist and I want to create art about climate change, actually. And right now, my only output uh, outlet is unfortunately Instagram. But that's all. That's a dream for down the line when I'm quite old. That sounds great. And there are some people I can introduce you to if you're really serious about that climate and art intersection, just to, yeah, to keep the definitely. mind fresh and, and going. I and love that, it. Again, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Thank you. I appreciate that. I love it. And uh, taking you back to the time that, that you were a student on campus, is there a special memory or cherished memory of your time at Yale that you think about when you're in the trenches? Yeah, so many. Actually, um, I, I was an editor at the, at the Yale Daily News when I was in college. And being an editor at the Yale Daily News comes with almost uh, zero compensation, no financial compensation for sure, but it's not as if it's like a lot of people don't think it's worth it because it takes at least 35, 40 hours of your week. And you're often pulling all nighters to make deadlines and get the publication out. And it's kind of incredible the quality of the journalism that comes out of an incredibly just student run organization. And so I have a lot of memories of walking back to Silliman from the YDN, which is, you know, by York and, and, and walking back at one, two, three in the morning and the campus was totally quiet. And I would in those moments look around and 
I couldn't believe how lucky I was to be at Yale. I know it sounds super corny, but you know, you have to remember I was a scholarship kid at my high school and scholarship kids at my high school served the rich kids lunch and we had to wear hair nets and, and give them food. And Yale was this, this beautiful privileged place where no one needed to know I was a scholarship kid. No one needed to know that I was, I, I grew up, um, you know, in a, in a broken family or without money. And at Yale, you could explore what you wanted and you can just do what you're passionate about. And, and coming back early in the morning from the YDN felt like a privilege because we were all in the trenches together. And it was that solidarity of this group of ragtag bunch of people who were deeply committed to this college daily. And then, and because we were committed to it above all else, we, we, put out what I thought was was kind of cutting edge quality work. And so it was also a testament to maybe giving up some of the short term fun, like attending a few less parties, but also um, the, a testament to what deep commitment can bring if you're working in solidarity with other like minded folks. Your mom must be so proud. <laughs> well, you know, she's an immigrant mom, so she, she, sometimes she shows that, sometimes she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, both my parents as well, I, I can relate to that. Uh, so last question before we uh, open it up to the audience question. So you have shared so much about your personal journey, your professional journey, uh, being honest about the, the challenges that you've had to overcome. And um, I'm just curious, how do you define success at this stage in, in your career and and you've accomplished so much, but what do you reach for at this point? What keeps you going? I honestly don't know if my definition of success has evolved that much over the years. And, and I think, you know, when I, it, it seems like a brilliant move to join the Obama campaign in 2007 now, but at the time, no one thought it was a brilliant move. People said, you know, he's going to lose, right? And, and I, and I too, honestly thought, he would lose, but it didn't matter to me because I didn't care to be on the winning team. I just wanted to be on the team that I believed in surrounded by people who believed in that too. And so it worked out that, that, that he, you know, he was such an amazing candidate and so many people believed in him too, but that was not the reason why I signed up. I didn't sign up for the White House job, but it, it came eventually. And so an important lesson there was do not do the thing that, do not do things simply for the destination. If COVID has taught us anything, it's that we cannot rely on the, the expected destination to appear. It, things change all the time. Circumstances change beyond our control. And what we can control is doing the thing that we love to do every day. And even if, in its most painful moments, and startup life has a lot of painful moments, really existential, painful moments, um, I still love the work because it feels like we're building towards something greater than ourselves. And so my definition of success is to continue to do that, you know, to, 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 the only thing I can make sense about this privilege that I think a lot of us have from going to Yale is, is to use that privilege to open up opportunities for people who don't have that privilege. Otherwise this privilege makes no sense. It's arbitrary. And so, uh, success is also being good to, you know, your friends and family and the people who are closest to you. Uh, in my entrepreneurial journey, I haven't always been the best, you know, friend, daughter, family member, partner, and I've definitely in the the last several years tried to reorient success in life to be about those things. Um, and relationships are truly the most important, and and also to just work. To work, just do do anything you want, but just try to work in, in service of something other than yourself. That, that idea of being of service and adding value and changing systems and infusing equity, uh, those are just wonderful takeaway ideas for all of us. So thank you, Steph. And I see that Ellen has uh, rejoined us, so it must be time for our Q&A. Thanks, Lauren. 
Thank you so much for a super engaging discussion. I found myself nodding along to a lot of it, um, especially as someone who's raised funding and, and has kind of gone through that startup grind. So uh, a lot of really great lessons to take away there. So we've got a lot of audience questions, so I will start to read them off. Let's jump right into it. Uh, so question from Dave. Um, so I know you've talked a lot about equity uh, and kind of access um, to clean energy for, uh, for lower income folks. Um, so Dave asked, do you feel that putting a price on carbon, carbon emissions, either a fee or a tax, would benefit low-income families or hurt them, since in general they don't have the means to transition to cleaner technologies at this point? Yeah, and, and I think that's a really important question, but I think there are ways to compensate for having a, a price on carbon. You know, you can give low-income families a tax credit, you can give them um, a subsidy, there are ways to make sure that we are properly accounting for the negative externalities that fossil fuels and other carbon intensive technologies have in our, in our society, while also being sure that we're not penalizing people who are low income. And, and they're important policy levers that we should be discussing in tandem with carbon taxes. Awesome. All right, next question. Uh, do you view Solstice as primarily a developer, an advocacy organization, a customer management service, or something else entirely? And how do you balance and split your time and the company's resources among those goals? Yeah, you, you know, I was actually doing Solstice full time at the same time I was going to business school. And I had this moment where I felt like I was doing two things and I was going 140% because I was just feeling like I was running around all the time, but I was doing each thing at 70%. So I was getting a C at life. And it really made me realize that, you know, uh, there's a famous strategy professor at Harvard. And he says that the, the essence of strategy is knowing what not to do, what to say no to, what to deprioritize. And so Solstice does, is a, it's an ambitious organization. And so much of what we're trying to do has never been tried before. And so we actually have two entities. We have a nonprofit, 501c3, that is entirely focused on low income and black indigenous people of color access to solar. And thankfully, as of last year, there is an executive director for that organization that's not me, which means I'm not running both organizations. Um, and that that we also have a separate organization that's a customer services and software companies. And that is companies undertaking the whole customer experience for community solar. We're enrolling in, um, customers for local projects. We're educating communities on what community solar is. We're handling the billing and the crediting and the integration with utility accounts for the life of the 20 year project. And so we, by, by owning that whole customer experience, we're also trying to make it more inclusive by doing things like creating software for the energy score idea of getting beyond the FICO credit qualification standard that bizarrely exists in solar. Um, whereas a nonprofit does a lot of uh, pro project development and policy advocacy and uh, financial, re like data science basically to prove that the risk of serving low-income customers is the perceived risk is greater than the real risk because no one's proven that before. So to answer your question, we have two separate entities, two bank accounts, two separate staff, two separate um, boards and, and two separate funders. And, and that's how we kind of try to do so much with, with scarce resources. Awesome. I mean, and I'm very happy for you that you were able to find someone to kind of take over and run uh, run the nonprofit and advocacy side because I know uh, delegation is definitely a skill that uh, that is learned and having team members is a great a great asset. Yeah, I mean, we don't do anything alone. Like I don't do, I literally do nothing alone. And people, I wish people um, would dissuade themselves of that idea. I have an in incredible teammates and the person who runs the nonprofit, her name is Lauren. And she's really worked her whole life in service of justice and equity. And then my co-founder on the for-profit side, her name is Sandhya. She is the best business partner that you can ask for. Just incredibly kind, hard worker, um, brilliant at, at building coalitions and getting people's trust and, and just incredibly diligent. So these are some of the amazing people that work at Solstice. Awesome. 
Um, we have a question from Bob. Uh, he asked if you are um, aware of the 30 million solar homes uh, label or advocacy project. Um, I think he, he mentions that part of the thinking of the people who started it was more around self-reliance and a smaller role for poor profit energy companies and wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, actually um, have had conversations with the, uh, some of the folks who are active in that movement. And, and I think it's an incredible, incredible initiative. And what I said earlier is that climate change is so big, so intractable, such a big problem that that's so complex and touches literally every industry that this is an all hands on deck problem. And so to say that, you know, we really need to only rely on a smaller community decentralized projects and, and have no role for for-profit energy companies, I think is not really gonna solve climate change. And so everyone needs to be better at being just and equitable. And we've talked about that, but um, especially for-profit companies. Like I often say, do we need 20% returns or could we do less have lower returns and have more justice in the world? You know, why do we need CEOs to earn 300 times the lowest paid employee? We don't, that's insane. That's, this is, um, I don't believe that, that we should have unfettered, unstructured, unregulated markets, but markets are an incredibly important force for building scale. And we need scale to get to the gigatons level of carbon emissions that we need to um, decarbonize our economy by. So, so I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a one sector is the silver bullet, one sector is going to save us all because I want everyone to care more about climate and care more about climate justice and, and take tangible steps to, to work towards that. Awesome. Well, speaking of market and uh, regulation, um, this ties into a little bit of potentially the failures of those uh, of those areas. Uh, someone did want to know about the power outages in Texas and um, best paths forward for Texas, for example, in terms of uh, clean energy investment. Yeah, actually, I wrote a statement. I was so incensed <laughs> by the situation in Texas that I wrote a statement and you can find it on our blog. Our website is solstice.us or you could go on my Instagram, which is linked in my LinkedIn and, and read it there. But essentially, Texas was infuriating because of a few reasons, but largely because we've gotten away from thinking of energy as a human right. And we have we got to a place in Texas where we thought it was more important for to have short term profitability than to have long term energy stability. Um, you know, there are all these stories about how the grid operator in in Texas was warned, you have to winterize your equipment and energy companies didn't do it because they didn't want to cut into their quarterly returns and profitability, but look what happens when we don't put the correct measures in place and, and um, demand that we have stability in our power provision. And there are also other, you know, frustrating parts about Texas in that they're, because they're so independent, they couldn't take on emergency su power supplies from the other grids in the country. And they, we should kind of redo regulations such that there's a power mandate in place, um, power provision mandate that exists across the country, such that we do things like winterize our equipment like there exists across the country, such that that grid can take on emergency power from other grids um, nearby in situations like natural disasters, which are only happening more and more. And so I think there's a lot of things we can do. And I always try to when I do write something, I always try to suggest solutions and not just complain about the problems. And so that's why I actually mentioned the blog is because it has a list of things that we need to change to make sure this doesn't happen again. And the last thing is with Texas, as well as just the pandemic in general, it's been so hard to watch, I think, for so many people because a lot of the suffering and the hurt and the death was preventable. So yes, Texas was a natural disaster, but it was also a man-made disaster. It didn't have to be that bad. And so hopefully we take lessons from that and, and, and modernize our grid and change our regulatory structures such that we can make sure that people don't have to die needlessly again. Absolutely. And you would think that uh, Texas would be all for renewables and reducing reliance on a, uh, on a 
less robust grid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they definitely have a lot of win. I think, you know, obviously fossil fuel interests are, are, are real and it just shows that it's really hard to get people to divest from their self-interest. Even if it means that their grandchildren will have a better future, it's really hard. And so thankfully, if um, there are just a couple studies that have been released in the last couple of weeks about how fossil fuels have actually performed on a financial basis terribly in the last 10 years as compared to renewable energy. And so that's also uh, the power of markets is that even if there are a ton of people, unfortunately, in the world who don't believe in climate change, we can get them to do the right thing. We can get them to take climate friendly action because renewable energy is, is, is lucrative too. That is, that's powerful for a lot of people. Even if you or I are not motivated by money, a lot of people are, unfortunately. Absolutely. And uh, Dale Cohen has posted, posted the link to the blog in the chat as well, if you want to check that out. Um, all right. So uh, another question is, um, any chance that ocean wave energy will be viable in the near future? I don't know about the near future, but I mean, I think that what is so another thing that's exciting about a lot of the bills that are coming out for the infrastructure bill or some of the other um, grant programs that the Department of Energy are planning is a lot of more R&D funding. I'm not an ocean wave expert. I do enjoy the ocean. I think it's therapy. I think it makes everyone feel better when they're in the ocean. And I happen to be from Hawaii, so I'm biased. But um, so I don't want to comment on the specific technology, but I do know that there's a lot of money going towards alternative um, uh, sources of power that aren't just wind and solar right now. And, and that feels so good compared to where we were a year ago. Awesome. All right. So we had a question from Norman, um, who recently signed up for solar installation, but his condo association did not uh, did not. Um, commit to it. And so he had to act on his own. So I guess the question is, um, you know, if someone does want to sign up for solar and wants to get their community involved, what are the steps for them to take? For a community solar project, you mean? Yes. So community solar exists in two, largely two different regulatory frameworks. And this is where, uh, when we start to get into the details of our energy system, I think the most maddening part of it is that so much of our energy hinges on local state by state regulations, which are really parochial and varies vastly across the country. But the, there are two regulatory regimes community solar exists. One is a state legislature will pass a law saying people can benefit from solar that's not on their own home, either in a community solar law or community renewables law. And then about 22 states in the country have this sort of law. And then in the other, in another 20 states in the country, utilities are taking the lead in lieu of an actual law in place. Utilities are realizing, oh, we should do more renewables. Our customers are demanding we do more renewables. Well, let's try out a pilot of community solar. And so the two paths forward, if you are in a place that doesn't have community solar legislation yet is you gotta get your lobby, your regulators and your utility to offer it um, and try to get your utility to offer it at a discount like the rest of the country because utilities are often offering it at a premium um, or you have to get the state legislatures and your local elected officials to care about community solar. And here's the argument you use with them. You say, I think it's very clear from the pandemic that we need to get more people access to clean energy in order to all thrive in the future. We need to make the energy system more equitable. There are actually not that many clean energy products that are, that are accessible to people who don't have a lot of money. There are not many clean energy products that aren't a premium. Community solar is one of them. Community solar is one of the best tools to increase access to people who have been shut out of the, the market, low to moderate income Americans and black indigenous people of color. Is this something you can support? And I, I challenge you to, to find elected officials who care about those issues, because I think they'll be, get behind it once they understand community solar. Awesome. Um, and someone slightly tying into that, uh, someone had a question about um, alternative renewable energy services, such as clean choice. Um, and uh, one, if community solar offers a similar product, and also if consumers who can sign up for both should do so. 
Yeah, if you can sign up for both, definitely. And But here's the issue with um, retail electricity suppliers that are offering renewable energy is, is they are offering you uh, a chance to participate in the clean energy economy. And what you're buying actually are RECs, renewable energy certificates that are produced somewhere in the country. And the issue though, is it's always offered at a premium. Sometimes they'll get you at teaser rates. And if you read the small print, always read the small print on those mailers that you receive on the back, it'll say, we can jack up the price on you anytime. And so I think there, there, that's the reason why there have been a lot of class action lawsuits against energy companies. That's a little bit why energy companies have such a poor reputation in local communities as cheating people and scamming them is because those prices are changing without the need to tell customers that prices are changing. And so, you know, not speaking about any one company in general, but but there are only 6 million households out of 130 million households in this country that pay more, uh, that pay for green power, which is generally a premium. So out of 130 million households, only 6 million pay for green power. Well, if we're relying entirely on premium products, we're not going to get to 100% renewable or clean energy. We're not going to make it, we have to make it more accessible to people. So one benefit of community solar is in most of the states is offered in, it's it's a guaranteed discount. And it's a guaranteed discount um, as long as you're a part of the program, which can be 20 years. And and so that's that's a difference. And it's just, it's also, you know, going to serve a different population. Like some people are really happy to pay more for green power, most people can't, especially in this economy, especially when we live in an economy where people refuse to increase the federal minimum wage above 725, how do we expect people to pay for premium renewables? So all of these issues are tied together, but, um, but in, if you can do both, absolutely. Go, go be that environmentalist that makes more clean energy get built in the world. But unfortunately, not everyone's in that position. Awesome. So uh, we actually we have a lot of questions. We actually have a super engaged audience, which is really great to hear. And I think people are really appreciating the information. So I'm going to focus it down to two more questions um, and, and focus those on. Uh, we'll do one one kind of general question and then we'll have one that's more focused on uh, kind of what students can do today. Um, so uh, kind of a question more in the uh, supply chain. So does Solstice do any work in developing an ethical and equitable supply chain for solar products? Yeah, so I mean, we definitely, uh, I saw another question about how do we partner with solar uh, solar partners or solar developers. So other than the, the nonprofit doing some development projects specifically for low income communities the the other entity the the like customer services and software company we don't develop projects but we do work with developers who are values aligned you know we we pick the developers that we want to work with to supply our customers with power who do believe in justice and equity and inclusion um, and so that's one way that we're able to to say you know like we, we have standards and we hope that you meet them if you want access to our, our customers. Um, though we are not the developers in general ourselves. And so we're not the ones sourcing the panels. Uh, we're not the ones who do the, the disposal of you know, the solar panels or the recycling of solar panels at the end. And so that does put us a step removed, but it's important for us to work with partners that that our values align in that sense. And then the other way that we um, try to kind of change the face of the solar industry is through that workforce development side of things. And so just making sure that we're hiring folks who don't look like your typical solar industry worker. And, and that the more we do that, the more we, you know, black and brown folks we put on our boards, uh, the more I think we will have a chorus of folks who are demanding more ethical and equitable supply chains for solar. Awesome. All right. And I'm going to just switch us to our last question, which kind of combines two questions here. Uh, what advice would you give current Yale students um, in terms of what degrees, uh, you know, you kind of look for in this space or what kind of skills they can uh, start focusing on now while they're in school if they want to get engaged with renewable energy and clean energy and kind of the whole clean tech space? Yeah, I, I've come to realize that, and, and a lot of studies show this, that when you're playing to your strengths, 
then you will do better work. You will be more engaged with your work and you will, um, you will enjoy your work more. And so the, I don't think there are any degrees that you need to work in clean energy, um, short of, you know, actually getting certifications to be installers or electricians and, and actual engineers. And um, generally speaking, we don't put a single degree requirement in any of our job descriptions because you don't need a degree to do this work. And, and putting a degree requirement generally excludes people who come from more disadvantaged, vulnerable, under-resourced backgrounds. So I don't think you need any degrees. And I know that's rich of me to say, given that I am overeducated, but you know, I am the child of immigrants. So I had to get a couple of masters if I wasn't gonna get the doctorate for my mom. But um, uh, obviously an education is important, but I think it's much more about skills and doing the work. You will move, if I've learned anything from starting over my career, you know, go, leaving my dream job at the White House and becoming an intern in Pakistan, <laughs> that was my move. And then um, not taking like the well-paid job out of college and, and just taking a job in which for a year, my job was to go around and knock doors all over the country for 12 hours a day. That was my job, knocking on doors. And so if I've learned anything from those experiences, it's that you all you need to focus on is really is, is just a desire to contribute. And if you contribute, if you look around and see pain points in your organization or pain points for your manager or pain points for your team members, and you solve their pain points, you will continue to be promoted in, in life. Um, and then because energy is a very technical field, yes, go get training in whatever is your interest. Do you like building things? Do you like the engineering side? Do you like the installation side? Then go, go learn that. Do you like the computer science side? Computer uh, software will only continue to massively grow because energy traditionally has had terrible software experiences and there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, do you like, are you a good project manager? Then go be a developer because that's a gazillion, juggling a gazillion work streams at once. Um, do you, are you good at sales? Go, go work in sales at some company because every single company needs better salespeople. And, and we need more women and people of color to do sales too. So a lot of, I think these are translatable skills to different industries and climate has a place for everyone. Just focus on what you're good at, what you enjoy doing and, and focus on what, how you wanna contribute to solve pain points around you and you will keep moving up. I will absolutely second that, uh, second that advice. Also speaking as someone who is an art major and is now in medical devices. So, uh, there you, it, go. you know, your, your actual major doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily matter, but it really does, uh, does matter kind of how you apply it and how you apply your skill and your willingness to learn. Um, excellent. I think that is all that we have time for. Um, we do have additional questions in the chat and uh, thank you everybody for your questions, even if we weren't able to get to them. Um, we really appreciate the, uh, the really actually very active engagement um, of the folks in the webinar. Uh, Lauren, a big thank you to you for moderating um, and thank you so much, Steph. I think people really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed the content here, uh, really appreciated your insight into uh, Solstice and the, the general renewable energy market. Um, we'd also like to thank Yale Blue Green and Yale Women for co-sponsoring tonight's event. We couldn't do it without you and the YAA shared interest groups for making this event possible. A recording of this evening's webinar will be posted on the Accelerate Yale LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube channel. So check us out there. Uh, and our next event is on April 8th at 8 p.m. EST with Brian Leach of Ibotta. Ibotta is a popular app that gives cash back for purchases. All right. Well, thank you so much, Steph and Lauren, again. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for, as always, for making all of this happen. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for participating and for joining. Have a absolutely wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.